a place to myself last night. The hostel, completely empty. So I got a good night's sleep, thank goodness, because I needed that. Really needed that. Anywho, the sun has just come out. Uh, I'm getting hungry, haven't had coffee yet. I'm trying to pack up as quickly as I can. And then, we're off to Carp. And then tonight, Athens. It's gonna be a good day, I think. I can feel it. All right, let's get the show on the road. This is the Corinth Canal, it's impressive. Built in the uh, 1880s, I think. And against that constant rattling of the bridge and the dogs barking, it's probably a, a very appropriate place to begin the story of Corinth. Because although this canal was built in the last decades of the 19th century, it was not the first attempt to bridge the isthmus. Corinth's story is very much dependent on the geography of this stretch of land, the isthmus, that connects mainland Greece with uh, the Peloponnese, this big peninsula that we've been riding our way around. And ever since they built the canal, the Peloponnese Peninsula is technically an island because the canal bridges the Ionian Sea with the Aegean at sea level. There's no locks. So yeah, technically the Peloponnese is an island. But anyway, this stretch of land, which is six to seven kilometers from coast to coast, has been for centuries, millennia even, a vital connection, a vital strategic point. And Corinth is built five kilometers over there, directly on the northern coast of the Isthmus. And from there, from that strategic location, it was able to control this stretch of land, the, the Isthmus, and uh, enforce tolls and levies on people passing through it. But there's a problem. If you're traveling from the northwestern Mediterranean or the western Mediterranean, Italy, um, and you're heading to the eastern Mediterranean, you have to sail all around the Peloponnese, this jagged, rocky peninsula that is frequented by storms and strong winds. Uh, in ancient times, that was a dangerous and time-consuming trip. So the idea of building a canal straight through it, only six kilometers, bridging the two seas, the Ionian and the Aegean, is not a new idea. Around the turn of the seventh, sixth century BC, Corinth was ruled over by a tyrant. Again, we've talked about that. It's just the, it's just the term of political office. His name was Periander, and he decided he was going to bridge the two seas. He was going to build a canal. He tried and failed. It was just uh, too much of an undertaking in the 6th century to construct a canal of this scale, but not one to be put down. He decided he was going to build a road instead, a railway even. And this is it. It's called the Diocus. And as you can see, it's a stone road, and it stretched from here to the south side, about six or seven kilometers. And the idea was that ships could sail into here, unload their cargo onto supposedly carts, wheeled carts, and possibly even haul the ship itself up onto these carts, and then transport the whole thing on these carts across the isthmus. And if you look closely at the road, you can see two parallel trenches, uh, channels, dug in, purposely dug in. This is why it's been likened to the first railway, because these channels guided the carts along this set track. They were obviously pulled by uh, mules or donkeys, maybe even manpower, uh, we're not sure. Predominantly, it must have been used for trade and maybe there was like uh, two different fares you could pay to transport just the cargo to the other side or maybe you could pay to transport the cargo and the boat so that you could continue on, we're not sure. 
but it was also used for warfare. At numerous times over the centuries, fleets have been transported across the Isthmus by land so that they could avoid having to sail all around the Peloponnese. You may remember a few episodes ago we were talking about Octavian and Mark Antony and the Battle of Actium. Well, after that battle, Octavian sent a portion of his fleet overland across the Isthmus using the Dialcus. It was much faster, much faster than sailing around the Peloponnese. It's estimated you could go from there to there in six hours or maybe even less. And no doubt Corinth benefited from controlling this immensely important piece of infrastructure in the ancient world. But the idea of a canal didn't go away. Nero, yes, the Emperor Nero, him of fiddling Rome and burning violins, or the other way around if you prefer, broke ground here, the story goes, with a golden pickaxe. This was his project, now he was going to succeed in building a canal, but he failed. And not only did he fail, but his project probably destroyed portions of the Dialcus, putting it out of order, because at the end of the late Roman period, the sources sort of stopped mentioning any uh, use of the Dialcus. Nevertheless, for the better part of eight or nine centuries, with a little bit of a, an interlude in between, we'll come to that, Corinth sat here on the Isthmus, controlling both this strategic land bridge and this monumental piece of infrastructure and it boomed. From the Archaic period to the Classical period, the Hellenistic period, Corinth was a major player in Greek and wider Eastern Mediterranean affairs until the Romans came along and sort of wiped it off the map. But uh, Rome was not only the great destroyer of things, it was the great builder of things too. And under Rome, Corinth bounced back for another two or three centuries. And it is Roman Corinth that we're gonna go see now. I said Roman Corinth is what we're going to see and that's because Roman Corinth is all you can see. The Corinth of old, the Corinth of classical Greece is buried somewhere within and beneath this labyrinth of ruins. In the mid second century BC, after a series of Macedonian wars, as they're called, Rome was putting the final touches on its conquest of Greece. The Achaean League was an alliance of Greek city-states formed to resist the uh, onslaught of Rome. Corinth was a member, and unfortunately for Corinth, it didn't go so well. During the Achaean War, Corinth was utterly sacked. All the male inhabitants of the town were killed, women and children sold into slavery, and the city ransacked and burned to the ground. At its height, Corinth was a major player in the ancient Greek world, wealthy, powerful, renowned for its trade and the success of its colonies, of which Syracuse is probably the most well-known, but it was also respected for its military prowess, the trireme, which became the standard template for worship in the Mediterranean world, right up until the post-Roman period was supposedly invented here in Corinth. And the city maintained a presence in famous conflicts such as Thermopylae and Salamis, its hoplites donning the iconic Corinthian helmet. So it was unwilling to submit to the increasingly powerful Roman Republic, something I'm sure they regretted as the legions pillaged and ransacked the once luxurious city of ancient Corinth. But about a hundred years after the sacking, some uh, noble romantic named Julius Caesar decided to refound the city. And it was a great success. The colony, which was founded here in the footprint of its ancient predecessor, thrived, becoming this, a major Roman city here in the Isthmus. I come from a long line of shopkeepers and I'm sitting here in one of the commercial districts of the old Roman city. You can see the, the shop fronts preserved in the stonework. And yeah, I can imagine this place on a, what day is today? A Thursday afternoon, two millennia ago. The noise, the hustle and bustle, the haggling, the sights and the smells, as they say. Over there then is the Temple of Apollo from the 6th century BCE. So a survivor of the sacking of Corinth, a throwback 
to its glory days as an independent Greek city-state. And yeah, let's take a look around. My leg has gone dead. <laughs> Even if you don't have much of an interest in ancient history, if you come from a Christian part of the world, there's a good chance you are already acquainted with Corinth because of the Bible. Paul the Apostle, or Saint Paul, lived here for 18 months, about 100 years after Corinth was refounded by Julius Caesar. And his time here is uh, well tracked, is well recorded in Acts, in the Bible, and in the two letters which he wrote to the Christian church here in Corinth after he had founded it. Corinthians 1 and 2. Now, historians speculate that there were more letters, but they have been lost. Nevertheless, those letters, you know, alongside containing some, you know, some beautifully written phrases of language, such as, uh, you know, the when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child, and the, the much quoted um, through a glass, darkly. Uh, alongside that, it's a, it's a valuable record of you know, the foundation of the early church. Uh, those letters are written to instruct and guide the, the, the fledging church here in Corinth, trying to establish itself and navigate a still, you know, somewhat hostile environment. Since Corinth had been founded only a hundred years previous to Paul's time here, it was, uh, it was a new, it was a youthful city. It didn't have the, the weight of, you know, institutions and, and norms that cities such as Rome or even Athens uh, had. Here, you know, it was, you, could, you could be a self-made man, as it were, and Paul certainly made himself here, and, and the church did well here. Of course, the empire, about 200 years after Paul's time, would become a Christian empire. Behind me are the remains of later Roman Corinth, Byzantine Corinth. Uh, much like the rest of the empire, Corinth suffered some decline during the fourth century, and then to sort of hammer at home was devastated by two earthquakes in 365 and 375, two earthquakes 10 years apart. So much of the destruction that we see around us is, uh, is thanks to those two earthquakes. Nevertheless, the city was rebuilt on a monumental scale and much of the original buildings from the imperial time and even you know the preceding Greek times were salvaged, shall we say. In the rebuilding of uh, Byzantine Corinth and in the defences that uh, I think we're actually going to go see some. They're sort of on our way, so we'll, we'll pop around there. It is actually starting to get late, later than I expected. But I think I'm going to stop regardless for a coffee because my energy has just suddenly plummeted in the last 40 minutes. Not sure why. I think I need a coffee. I only had one coffee this morning. Usually I have two. It's a lovely evening though. The light is gorgeous. Really nice autumn light these days. It's, uh, it's good for the soul. Great. Let's ride. This is the ancient theater, by the way. It's in really bad state. I'd argue the one in Cordoba is even better preserved than that. Shocking. The theaters, when they fell out of use, they were often quarried in later centuries for their, uh, their stone and burned in lime kilns. No doubt something similar has happened here. By the looks of it. Oh wow, there it is as well. So, the best educated amongst you might be able to discern that this is, in fact, a wall. It dates from the 5th century. Construction began during the reign of uh, the Emperor Theodosius II, and then it was improved um, by the Justinian, as in Justinian the Great. But why I wanted to come here is because, by this time, the Roman Empire was Christian. And therefore, to build this 6-7 kilometer long wall, Across the isthmus, 
they cannibalized a lot of the structures, like from sites as uh, like ancient Corinth and um, all the surrounding pagan sites that were not so important to them anymore. Around this time, the theatres fell out of use, the shrines were torn down, and uh, yeah, it was all put into building fortifications like this. Case in point, here we are. You don't belong there. I mean, you do now, but that wasn't where you were meant to be. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. So look, here you can really see how the wall is constructed. We're on the, the inside of the wall, the defensive side. You can see that it's made out of uh, stone and, and, and mortar. You can see some steps going up and then inside the interior of the wall is made out of uh, rubble, mortar, there's a mosquito trying to get at me, and then on the outside of the wall, the offensive side, which is the side that would be under attack, got these very large, very um, strong, imposing stones. Oh my god, Jesus, mosquito, chill, man, you're not getting me. Just trying to fly into my visor. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good example of the Hexamillion wall. I had no idea there was sections as well preserved as that. Cool. Very nice. All right, now GPS, tell me where to go. I'm ready for you now. I'd say on a calm day it must be amazing to swim amongst these ruins and I was kind of hoping that that would be the case but anyway it's getting too late even if it wasn't so uh, so rough. Anyway this is the the port here at Kenkere. It's Corinth's uh, southern port. Corinth had a northern port on the north side of the isthmus and uh, here on the southern side. And as you can see it's, it's nicely preserved um, but the reason why it's important is because it is from here that Paul the Apostle left Corinth for the last time and it is here, um, if I can remember this correctly, he met and befriended Phoebe who was the deacon of the small church here at Kenkere and she was the one whom he trusted to take uh, his letter to the church in Rome, that being, you know, Romans from the Bible. Here he shaved his head and yeah, it's an important uh, Christian site. I bet you weren't expecting this to turn into a biblical history episode, but uh, there you go. For me, the Bible is just an invaluable source. Um, both testaments, of it. obviously, you know, I'm Irish. I was raised Catholic, but uh, you know, I I tend to only take it as uh, for its historical value. But you know, obviously, that's a belief as much as uh, you know believing in. The word of it is. I'm not really interested in arguing the validity or, you know, the truth of what it all means. As with any religion, it's, uh, it's completely personal. When it comes to faith, it's not up for debate. Everyone is, thankfully, in this part of the world allowed to believe whatever they they would like but uh, you know I've been thinking about religion the last two days because two nights ago I was staying at the hostel and I wasn't alone there was a, a middle-aged guy there and we got talking and uh, he started talking about um, a place called Mount Athos you might have heard of it it's a, a Greek mon monastic settlement um, it's famous now on the internet 
because of a few documentaries, because no women are allowed there and whatnot. And he goes every year, he was telling me, and he started talking about the, um, you know, what it meant to him and the effect it had and being able to disconnect from the material world and enter a more spiritual place in himself. And, you know, I like talking to people about their, their beliefs and their religion because you don't have to share it to realize that there is some sort of commonality, there's some fundamental uh, element in all religions that is sort of, you know, just instilled in us as humans, that desire for peace, the search for harmony and finding our place within the world. So it was nice. And as he got a bit more comfortable, he started to open up a bit more. And then I was sort of like, ah, Jesus, here we go. He started talking about, uh, you know, on, in Athens, you know, I have to be careful about where I go because there's a lot of Muslim neighborhoods and, you know, a lot of Muslims now living in Greece. And I was like, oh, Jesus. You know, half an hour ago, you were talking about the goodness of your religion and now you're talking about the badness of another. Um, how is that compatible? So that's one of the other reasons why I didn't sleep very good. <laughs> two nights ago after having that discussion anywho bit of a, a grey way to leave the episode and grey ride to Athens ahead so better get going